Okay, so uh, yes, so welcome. Make yourself comfortable. Make yourself at home. We have all kinds of artworks, curiosities, objects, stories. Come on in, make yourself comfortable. Just to point your attention, this is a Judenhut drawing from Juan Pablo Plaza that he gave to me for my birthday. This is a work from Martin La Roche Contreras. He's an artist from Chile, living in Amsterdam. This is a work he made called To See the Inability to See. This is kind of the spirituality corner, as well as like before and after, and like considering these moments that we are living in. This is from Liu Chaozi. It's a, she's been doing a series of photographs of ways that people do really weird things with Buddhas in the West. So yeah, all kinds of things. Oh, here's a plate that I got from a friend of mine in New York, from David Kirchhoff. Maybe you can read it out loud. Not for few food use. Plate made poison food for decorative <laughs> purposes only. <laughs> oh. uh. So if you're curious about anything, just let me know. Oops. Just, just to say there's not only artworks in the collection, there's also things that I find, like for example, here you got uh, some broken glasses that I found on the street. I really like them. I feel like they're almost like releasing the, the pr one of the lenses out of them. Next to some glasses that Sophia made me, it was my partner for when I turned 26 years old. <laughs> You see. Uh, this is from Sana Vassan. She's an artist in Maastricht. You're, you're familiar with her? She took photos of all of the, the moles on her body okay. and collected them all into one spot to make this fake tattoo. Mm. This is my most recent acquisition, the last performance, uh, Thibaut Espio installed it. It's a work he does where he takes a big pen and hammers it into a wall. This is another, uh, let's say, can, like, up and coming famous artist, Robertas Narcos from Lithuania. He's going to represent Lithuania at the Venice Biennial, the upcoming one. And uh, here you have some towels from my grandmother when she thought she was going to die from cancer. Then she, she said, You can take anything you want from my home. So I went and I took these towels because when I was a kid, I would, uh, I, I dried my hands with them and she got very upset and she said, Those are not for you, they're for the guests. But really, they're not even for the guests. They're for nobody. They're, they're just for decoration. This is a work from uh, Marc Geoffrio. It's a friend of mine, an artist in, in Paris. So these are kind of standard pieces that you have inside of doors for the handles. And he noticed that the holes are quite similar to the distances of the eyes, average the middle points of mm -hmm. human eyes. So he engraved or had these eyes engraved onto it. So all the tiny things here, as well as the publication section. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. So um, this is a poster that I, I stole from the Metro in New York. I would always ride the train and I would look at this poster and it was always really fascinating to me because, well, I don't know, do you know who Jerry Orbach is? He was the actor in the TV show Law and Order and in the movie Dirty Dancing. And uh, well, the poster it says, Jerry Orbach gave his heart and soul to acting and the gift of sight to two New Yorkers. Jerry Orbach was a gifted actor and his greatest role was that of an eye donor. Years ago, Jerry decided to donate his eyes. When he passed away, he left behind the beautiful gift of sight. It only takes a minute to sign up to be an eye donor. Do it today! So uh, this poster always fascinated me because I didn't know that you could transplant eyes. So it was like a living science fiction every day. And then the other thing is I would always look at his face and see his little smirk, you know, and I would think, wow, there are two people in New York who each have one of his eyes. And maybe one day they would meet in the metro and they would sit across from each other and look into each other's eye and Jerry would look at Jerry. So one time I was looking at this poster and then I looked down to see who was opposite me and it was this person who had really intense red eyes who looked super tired 
So I said to him, hey man, is everything all right? And then he said back to me, this is me you're looking at. I am an assistant. I have been an assistant for eight years or maybe even more. I have been struggling with assistance for an artist of another generation. Let me tell you a little bit about this artist. What he does all day is he sits at home on an elevated chair. And in front of him is a big wooden table. And on that table is an assortment of computers, keyboards, and various electronica. And what he's doing is he's remote controlling others. His task is to be a sort of mothership in an art world. And then you have like five or six or seven galleries that are traveling around this artist in orbit like satellites. And then you have different individuals like academics, curators, carpenters that are shooting by like comets in a world that I am hovering in like some kind of a space cadet assistant. But I manage to get by to earn enough money each month to survive. But then recently this affair came up because I realized I've been making some serious errors in the works that I'm responsible for producing for this artist. You see, the thing is, I never told this to anyone before, but I am actually half blind. I'm not totally blind, but I'm incredibly far-sighted. I'm so far-sighted that I can see the other side of the horizon. It doesn't work like that, but you know what I'm saying? And these works that I've been gluing and assembling, well, they're very fine and meticulous. You gotta pay close attention when you're putting the parts together. But the way that I've been putting the parts together, well, I've been doing it in a really crooked way. And these works have already been signed by the artist. They've already been sent on art transport, which is very expensive, by the way. They've already had their certificates printed by the galleries. And they've already been bought by some important collectors and institutions. And then when I start to think about all the different people that are somehow involved besides the artist himself, you got postal workers, customs officers, framers, gallerists, cellarists, collectors, museums, even restorators. Shit, that's just a fraction of all the people that are somehow involved. And they're all getting paid, by the way. And there I am, the space cadet assistant, the source of all error. And so I decided that I needed to clear myself of this mess. And so I go to my employer, the artist, to tell him what I've done. And I say to him, yeah, I don't know if you've noticed, but I can't really see anything. And these works that I've been making for you, well, they just aren't right. And you know what he says to me? I think you're going to like this. He says, Beshuk smaya tzvachin le'ivra sagi nahor. Right? It means in the street of the blind, the one-eyed man is the guiding light. So you meet crazy people in the metro. So one time on the metro, I met this perfume seller. It was an older black man. And he had this belly. And on his belly were all these little bottles of perfume. And then he entered into the train, and he said this line that I will never forget. He said, smelling good is good. Smelling bad is bad. Who here wants to smell good? I know. It's a great line. It's like the best sales pitch that I ever heard. And the way that he said it, he had this deep Caribbean accent that was so soothing. I was hypnotized, swimming in his words. And then he said it again. Smelling good is good. Smelling bad is bad. Who here wants to smell good? But nobody said anything. So he left. He went to the next compartment on the train to see if he could find other clients. But his words didn't leave. 
They were still in my mind. They were still swimming. I was wishing that I could hear them again. And then after a few stops of the train, the unthinkable happened. He came back into the train. Now, I don't know if you've been on the metro, but they never come back. They always move on to new opportunities. But this time he came back and he said his spiel one more time. Smelling good is good. Smelling bad is bad. Who here wants to smell good? And so this time, I was ready. The words that were just coming out of me, and I said, I want to smell good. And so he, he came to me, and he took this bottle out of his belt, and he opened up the cap, and he flipped it, and he did like this, and then he let me smell it, and he said, this one's the baby's breath. And I said, sure, I'll take it. Just keep talking. And then he took out another one. It was this bottle, white amber. And by the end of this whole thing, I had bought like a whole pile of bottles. And I gave one to each of my friends. And I kept just this one bottle of white amber. And this bottle I'd had for over 10 years. But you know, I never really looked at the label and what it says, the, the brand name. But I just looked at it the other day and it reads, God sense in the name of God. And then on the back side, there's a phone number. Can you imagine? All these years I've had this bottle, more than 10 years, I could have called this number at any point to hear his angelic voice. But I thought that since you're here now, that maybe I could call and we could listen together. Um, hi, uh, yeah, um, I'm searching for somebody that I met on the metro 10 years ago who was selling perfume. I was selling perfume. I was never selling perfume. I think you had the wrong number. But maybe with the right reason. Excuse me, but who am I speaking with? Um, uh, my name is David. Hmm. David. David, my, my team and me, we study objects that are rendered as sacred. We engage with them, with the powers that lie within them and how they relate to humans. A subway train. Gunning fast is fast. Gunning slow is fast in slow motion through some pipeline. Stepping off a subway train and don't we all wish it is us dropping dimes on a Friday evening prime time? This perfume bottled up into a small capsule celebrating its 10th anniversary by generating a combination of numbers that brings you here. That is not all too crazy. You know, there exist objects much more powerful. I'm talking about tokens, portable icons, cards, sports relics, sacred artifacts, often wrapped in a foil, shiny, luring you into hunting and collecting, into trading and assembling, display. How is it possible that you are more convinced of the power of an artifact than the realness of your own being and what your will and mind, thought and spirit are capable of? Well, then I start to doubt. I ask myself, what does it give me? What does it give me being a fan? A fan. I can fan all I want, but the heat is only there to be found where I am waving at. Was I wanting to be Sue Bird so bad that I am her biggest fan, rooting for her, aligning my spirit with hers, and then when the game is done, letting her sign the floor of the game she won? Underlining the importance of this sports relic and forgetting it is us humans who charge these objects. David, 
when stepping off a subway train pack one line and know even though today it is not your prime time see how a team grows it is happening with your support your thoughts and your energy it lies with you for you use it and you will be done whenever wherever don't just display the booster pack but discover it and play the pack i always say take the cards in your hands and let them strike may they hit where the heart fits side just uh, take off your slippers you can sit on the, the left I will take the right <laughs> 